Hi there. Welcome to Light from Above. My name is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Wiseworth Church of Christ. Glad you could be with us on the program today. We're continuing our study about the New Testament church. Now we're going to move into a different area as it relates to the New Testament church, and we're going to look at the idea of the New Testament church in portrait. And today's picture, this portrait, if you will, is the Greek word ekklesia. So we're going to take a look at that, and take a look at that picture of that church building. It's a very precious building to our family. There's a lot of relatives buried there. There's dear friends of my parents there and my grandparents there. My great-grandparents are buried there. And so it's a very precious location to our family. And that building is important, but you need to recognize, and as we recognize, that building is just a building. The people are what make the church. And that lesson, that idea is really going to come out when you look at this idea of the church in portrait in the term ecclesia. Today we're going to look at you know, th these four main points. Ecclesia defined, and then the idea from what are we called, how are we called, and into what are we called. You know, language is really important, and it's something that you know, we need to study and we need to be aware of. And we often talk about the emphasis on the English language and Webster's Dictionary and things like that, and rightfully so. But sometimes we don't realize that the New Testament, even though we may be reading it in English, that's a translation. And for the New Testament purposes, it's a translation of the Greek language that is being rendered for us so we can understand. And some translations are better than others. Some try to establish a word-for-word -word comparison. Some of them try to give you the thought of it. Now, I, I tend to stick with more word-for-word -word type translations. I think they're more accurate. And it doesn't, it just, I just prefer that as opposed to ones that just sort of tell you what the verse is saying. I'd rather read what the verse says. In the Greek, you need to understand that, you know, the Greek language has been around for centuries. But even within the Greek language, there are different versions of Greek language. And the New Testament was written in the common language of the day, and it was used for three or four hundred years, quite a while. But when you're talking about centuries for a Greek language, you know, this particular form of Greek was called Koine Greek. And it's a dead language. And that's important because dead languages don't change. Their meanings stay the same. If you, if you see a word in Greek, in Koine Greek, then that word does not change meaning from when it was uttered. And you have all kinds of resources that you can look at to find out what does that word mean. But you see, in English, we don't have quite that going on. Every, every year, uh, the dictionary has to send out new words that's being added. Uh, maybe it might take some words out that aren't even being used anymore. It may modify definitions. Sometimes a particular definition may more, be more prominent in our day and age. And Our language is dynamic, but dead languages, they stay the same. Latin is another example. I studied Latin in high school and really enjoyed it, and it's another dead language. Whatever it meant then, that's what it means. Well, the same thing is true with the New Testament. And that's why it's so important to go back and study these words in Greek, because sometimes the English moves on us. And so we really need to understand what the words mean. We're going to do some of that, and I'm going to show you a good study tool that you can use to be able to do that. This is from BibleStudyTools.com. Uh, I'll show you the mechanics of it and how these screens are laid out. But you need to remember that with all sources, you need to trust but verify. People make mistakes. Some things are more accurate than others. And so you always want to do some comparison work, and we try to do that. But let's go through, and we'll take a look at the first, uh, the first section here. This is the Strong's numbering system. That comes from Strong's Concordance. Uh, James Strong or John Strong, um, whichever one it was, he numbered every single word in Koine Greek in the New Testament. And that numbering that he used became very popular. And so people will use that numbering system to go to other comparable Greek words. So you can go and look up a different word in a different dictionary by that number if you don't know Greek. And so that's a great resource. And then you have the original word. That's how it looked in the original day that it was written. And then you have the transliterated word. Now, what's a transliterated word? A transliterated word is when you take that Greek letter above it and you just give it the English equivalent. Now, that's important to note. Transliterated and translated are two different things. A lot of people don't recognize that. Transliterated is not a translation. That's really important. Well, why? Let me give you an example. Baptizo, baptism. 
You know, we render it baptism. And some people think that that's sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. But the word in the Koine Greek means to immerse. It does not mean to sprinkle or pour. But in our English, they'd redefine the word baptism to incorporate things that it does not mean. Well, why do we have the word baptism in our Bibles? Because they put the transliterated version of it, not the translation of it. And so that's important to note. So let's take a look at the next section here on our chart. And this is talking about word origin. You, know, you can really tell a lot when you're defining a term when you look at where did the word come from. And ekklesia comes from two different words. The first one is ek, which is a preposition. It means out or away from. And then it has the form kaleo, which means to call. So ekklesia means the called out ones. And you can see that from the word origin. And if you go over to the next section, it'll give you some key references to some other major reference work that you might find interesting. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. That's a major set. It's not coded to Strong's. Uh, also, there's an abridgment there called, sometimes we call that Little Kittle, and they give you the volume number and page number of the big set, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, and then also the abridgment uh, that you look at as well. And it also tells you the part of speech that's involved, whether it's a noun and a verb. And so that's important to take note of too. Now, if we look at the next section on the chart, we have the King James verse count. And this tells you how many verses in each book of the New Testament does this term show up. And the nice thing, I can't do this on this program, but if you're on the website and you do it, you can click on it and it'll bring up those verses and you can see and you can read through it. There's a lot of great online tools or softwares that you can use. But what this is telling you here is it's telling you the number of verses by New Testament book where this term shows up. Now that's going to be important in a moment to keep in mind. This chart, this yellow section is covering it's counting the verses, not the word. Now it'll be important to take a note of here in a minute. And then the next section of our chart is the definition. What does the term mean? Now there's a lot of different sources that this website pulls definitions from, which I really like, uh, but you need to know where those are coming from. And you may find other definitions that you might find useful as well. For example, I like the way Wayne Jackson defines it and how he defines it in his term, his article, Ecclesia Revisited. He said the Greek term for church is ekklesia, found 114 times in the New Testament. In a Christian context, the word is employed in four senses. One, it represents the body of Christians worldwide over which the Lord functions as head, Matthew 16, 18, Ephesians 1:22, 1 Timothy 3, 15. The expression can refer to God's people in a given region, Acts 9, 31. Number three, frequently it depicted a local congregation of Christians, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Revelation 1, 11. Number four, church could also signify a group of the Lord's people assembled for worship. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. Now, when we look at the next section on our chart, the King James word usage, one of the things you want to keep in mind, you have the option to select whether you want to have the King James word usage or the New American Standard word usage, and they're not the same. And so, sometimes you'll read a statement like the one I read from Wayne Jackson, he used a different count. Well, was Wayne mistaken when he did that? No, he wasn't. He uses, generally, the American Standard Version. It's an excellent translation. So it's based on a different set of manuscripts. So the count may not be exactly the same. That explains the discrepancy there. Now, in this shaded box, it tells you that the King James uses this term 115 times as church and three times as assembly. So that's what that term, that's what that word means. So sometimes looking at how the King James renders that Greek word in different places can help you get a better idea of what it means. Now the first entrance, instance of the word ekklesia is in the book of Matthew. And it's only found, Matthew is the only time in its place. Now notice Hugo McCord translates the term and notice what he says here in Matthew 16, 13 through 19. It says, Jesus came into the regions of Caesarea Philippi and asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They replied, Some say that you are indeed John the Immerser, and others Elijah, yet others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my heavenly Father. And I assure you that you are a small rock, and upon this foundation I will build my called-out people. And the gates of Hades shall not overpower them. 
I will give them the keys of heaven's kingdom to you. What you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and what you release on earth will have been released in heaven. I notice there in his translation, he uses the term, he doesn't use the term John the Baptist because that's the transliterated form. He tells you his name is John the Immerser because that's what he did. It, he immersed. That's what the term means. But he didn't use the word church in his translation here. I underline it and put it in black for you. It's, and he renders it the called out people. That's what ecclesia means, the called out ones. Here's a picture of Hugo McCord and what he said about it. He said, to make this translation as accurate as possible, the word church is eliminated in his, in his translation. The word church historically refers to a physical building, a meeting house, which the Lord's people of the first century did not build and for which there is no New Testament word. William Tyndale knew that church is an inaccurate translation of the New Testament word ecclesia, which simply means called out. So Tyndale, in the first English translation of the New Testament from Greek in 1525, eliminated church in favor of congregations. King James I, having a vested interest in the word church, since he was the head of the Church of England, did not like that change, so he ordered the 54 translators of the King James Version to use the word church. Alexander Campbell knew what Tyndale knew about the inaccuracy of the word, and in the Living Oracles, 1826, he, like Tyndale, used the word congregation. So, now Hugo McCord passed away May 14, 2004, and eventually he would go back to the word church. Now, why did he would do that? Well, he did that because people, you know, they understood that church wasn't a building. It was a group of people. And, you know, and, and that, he decided to make that change himself. It's his translation. He can do that. But you need to keep in mind that ecclesia is not talking about a physical brick and mortar kind of structure. It's talking about people. It's talking about people. Well, this is how Alexander Campbell, he had his own translation, as Hugo McCord mentioned. And I thought, well, I'll show you what, how he translated uh, this term. Uh, this is the uh, same thing. He, his version is called the Living Oracles, and this is the way he translated it. It says, And Jesus was going to the district of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? They answered, Some say John the Immerser, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who returned he do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replying said to him, Happy are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I tell you likewise, you are named stone, and on this rock I will build my congregation. And we'll read the rest of it there later. Now, Campbell would go on and make this statement in the explanation about this term. Church, ecclesia, ecclesia, congregation, assembly occurs 120 times in the sacred books. It's derived from ecleo, I call out, the called out. Such was the assembly in the wilderness, first designated the congregation. And, and he goes on there. And, and so you need to keep that in mind. Now, if you look at a, uh, you don't just have to see this in English. You can look at it, in like, for example, in this Dictionary of Word Origins. And this is a book that I have in my library, and I like etymology. And what this talks about the word church, it has O-E, which means Old English. Etymologically, a church is the Lord's house. Its ultimate source is Greek Kyrios, Lord, Master, perhaps most familiar nowadays from the words of the choral mass, Kari Elysian, Lord have mercy. The adjective derived from this was Kyrakos, which used in the phrase house of the Lord. And he goes on. Now notice, he doesn't point out, he points out the church, that word church, ecclesia, that's not there. So that's important to note. So, you know, you need to keep that in mind when you're looking at language. There's a lot of things that you might find interesting. Now, I mentioned this Tyndale uh, excuse me, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It's a big set. I'll show you a picture here, and this is what they said about that term. It says, this does not mean that we should banish the words church and congregation from our vocabulary. Apart from the impossibility of such an undertaking, there would be no sense in forgetting the wealth of meaning proper to these terms. What is needed is that we should grasp the precise significance of the word ecclesia, since at this point linguistic sobriety will help us to the true meaning and bearing of the standpoint of biblical theology. Well, what's he saying? Well, what he's saying is everybody recognizes that today English has changed to the point that if you use the word church, it means more than, it has more than one meaning in our day. Remember I told you there's a difference between a living language and a dead language? Well, our language has changed. 
is changed to the point that people recognize that the word church means more than just a congregation. It means more than just a building. It has different meanings. And so we have to be more careful about that. And, it, and basically that's what Hugo McCord decided on in later translations or editions of his translation. He decided to go ahead and go back to the word church because people just recognize it is really making a distinction now that really didn't make that much of a difference. But from what are we called? Let's take a look at from what are we called. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, what are we called out of? You're called out of darkness. Into what? Into his marvelous light. Well, how are we called? I mean, how does that happen? You know, some people, you know, they look around for, you know, mystical, magical experiences. Maybe they're waiting for someone from the dead to come back and talk to them. Or, but, you know, what does the New Testament tell us? How are we called from darkness into light? Well, look what the New Testament tells us. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15, Paul writing to them, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel. For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. So notice, you're called by our gospel. So when you read the gospel, you're being called. The, the, the words are speaking to you. You don't have to wait for someone to whisper in your ear or something like that. It's written down. You can read it. You read it instead of hear it. And that's important for people to note. Well, into what are we called? What are we called into? Well, let's take a look at Romans chapter 8, 28 through 30. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now, notice that, justification and glory. Who wouldn't want that? That's what we're called into. Well, how do we get into that? You know, into, into, that's what we're called into. Isn't that a great thing? Well, let's take a look at another passage when we talk about the idea into what we are called. And this is Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now notice, you know, the idea of, you know, the church. Well, that's that term ecclesia. Those who hear the gospel call are added to the church, the congregation, the saved ones. Notice being inside a church building alone is not salvation. You must answer the calling of God to be called out. Some people think that if they just walk into a church building, that, you know, they're part of the church. But you're not. You know, I mean, a building's a building. You may go to a building and you may worship God, but if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you're lost. Geography doesn't change any of that. See, that's, the, that's important you need to understand. A lot of people don't understand it. They say, well, I go to church. I go to church. I'm saved because I go to church. No, you're saved because you obey the gospel. The Lord adds you to the church to save. See, you, need, you really need to think about that. Sometimes people go to different religious groups and, and they'll have to tell about some experience that they had. You know, they'll try to convince them they're part of the elect. They had to receive the divine call separate and apart from the gospel. And if they convince them that that's true, they'll say, well, yeah, you're saved. And then they add, they add or vote you into their church. But that's not the way it was in the New Testament. The Lord added to the church, not men. Well, how'd that happen? Well, read Acts chapter 2. Those people heard the apostles' words and they obeyed it. They repented of their sins and they were immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2 verse 38. And just read it from there and you'll see it. The Lord added them to the church. He added them to the congregation. They are his people. You become one of his people. Going into a church building is not going to accomplish that. Remember, the church is people. Christ's people. 
Let's take a look at another one. In Colossians chapter 3, 14 and 15, Paul stated we are called into one body. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called into one body, and be thankful. Now, we'll examine the term body in a future lesson, but notice it says, to which also you were called in one body. That means there's unity there, no division. That's important to note. We have a lot of religious division out there. It shouldn't be that way. And yeah, they may, all these little divided parts are not a part of the one body. And that's important to note. Also, another thing that we need to make sure that you understand is there are false calls. They're false calls. Hey, you answer your phone. It's the wrong number. Well, you know, or if, you, if you're reading something, if you're reading a map and you're going through a different state and you have the wrong state there, it's not going to help you any. Yeah, there's such a thing as false calls. And that's something that we need to be mindful of. Let's take a look in Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9 of an example of that. Paul wrote to the churches of the province of Galatia. He said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So when people come knocking on your door and they say things like, well, you know what, we have another testament from Jesus Christ. And you look at it, you're like, well, wait a minute, this is different than what Paul wrote. It's not the same gospel. It's another gospel. It's a different gospel. It's not the same. It may look like it, but it's not. And it was a problem back in Galatians, and it's a problem today. You'll have people try to tell you, that we have a new gospel for you, a different testament. And Paul is saying, no, you stick to the New Testament. Why do you say that? Because there are false calls out there. There's people that have been deceived or are deceiving of other people. You need to make sure you stick to the New Testament. That call is important. Who is giving that call? So you need to pay attention to that. Who are you listening to? Are they valid? Are they truthful? Yeah, you know, they could be mistaken too. That's why we impress on people, read your New Testaments. Ecclesia. The called out ones. Well, let's just summarize our lesson today about the New Testament church in portrait, the idea of ecclesia. Ecclesia means the called out ones. We are called out. Well, from what are we called out? We're called out from the world. We're called out from the world. Well, how is that done? Well, we're called out by Christ's gospel. We're called out by the New Testament. And what are we called? We're called into his church and the marvelous light, into a great fellowship, into a great congregation of people. It's so important that we understand this principle because there are all kinds of things that are competing for our attention. You ever think about that? Yeah, I mean, you ever sit back and sort of stop and think about all the things that are competing for your attention? I get text messages, I get emails, I have websites, I have visitors come by, the telephone rings, somebody stops in, I have appointments. To, you know, there's all kinds of things calling to us wanting our attention. But can those things save us? The New Testament is calling you. The gospel is calling you to be reconciled to Christ. Are you listening? Are you reading? Are you understanding? If we can help you, please let us know. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. 
As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And, that, and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.